<laughs> Amen. If you don't like that kind of music, you're plugged into the wrong thing. Amen. <laughs> All right, turn to John chapter 19 with me this morning, please. The Gospel of, Gospel of John. John chapter 19, verse 17. John 19, 17. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Bless this word, Father. May it go forth for the purpose that you intended. I simply want to be the messenger. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. You get into Holy Scripture and all the Bible is holy. All Scripture is given by inspiration. It's God breathed. But there are certain passages in the Bible that are absolute that you need to understand. They're here. You need to read them. You need to what it's talking about. And this one is, when you're talking about the crucifixion of Christ and the cross, then don't miss that. If you miss that, you've missed the whole Bible. You can read the Bible in historical narrative. Certainly you can. You can read the Bible in the sense of uh, tracing the lineage of a certain people and all that. That's all fine. But my dear friend, this Bible is written to reveal Christ. Search the scriptures or end them. Amen. You think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. If you can read the Bible and miss Christ, you've missed it all. It's yeah. not here, folks, as just another book. The Bible is God's word. Yeah. Therefore, he's speaking to us through this holy book. And I want to talk to you this morning about the subject of the cross. This has been on my heart now for about three or four days. Preach the cross of Christ. The Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth, to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. To, the, uh, to this Saul of Tarsus, when he left out of the Damascus gate, as he would head, head north to Damascus with letters from the high priest so that he might find any of that way, that he might drag them back to Jerusalem where they could be stoned to death because he was a zealot. The Bible says plainly that when he left out, God met him on the way. He had to walk by Golgotha to get to where he was going. Because I firmly believe that outside the northern gate of Jerusalem is what's called Gordon's Calvary. And that Gordon's Calvary has a tomb. It's got a tomb and it's got a huge cistern underneath the ground. There's a garden there. And it meets all the requirements of where the Lord Jesus was crucified. You can go there to this day and you'll find an Arab bus station. And then there's a hill behind it like this. And that hill on top of that hill 2,000 years ago were three crosses, and the Lord Jesus was on one of them. Three crosses, three men dying that day. One of them was the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself a ransom for many. So the cross is where, my dear friend, this morning, that the sinner is reconciled to God. Romans 5 verse 10, 4 says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. The Lord Jesus Christ is one of these people that you just simply cannot stick in a corner somewhere and say, Well, I don't, I don't have an opinion about him. Yes, you do. He's the kind of person that you either are for or you're against. The Bible teaches plainly that if you don't know him, you reject him, then you're an enemy of God. Think about being an enemy. But at the cross, God reconciled you to himself. No longer enemies. This is why when they sing the songs like they did in here this morning, something inside your soul begins to move because you've got life in there. You're born of the Spirit of God. It is at the cross where the sinner is, the sinner is justified. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9 says, Much more than... Being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Justification is a legal term that says that you may be guilty and are guilty of all the crimes. If you've sinned one, you've sinned them all. But as far as God's concerned, your slate has been wiped clean. You've been justified. The sinner is redeemed at the cross. In Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse 7, the Bible said, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Think of redemption as God reaching out and taking you and pulling you out of the hell you were in. 
Think about redemption as the work of the Holy Spirit of God moving on the face of this earth among men and finding you somewhere. And where he finds you, he calls you back to himself. By his outstretched arm, and a type of it is Egypt, when the Lord reached in and he pulled the children of Israel out and he took them out from all the gods of Egypt. He judged every last one of them and none of them could stop him from pulling his people out. And my dear friend, nothing can stop God from redeeming your soul today. If you're willing to let him take hold of your heart, amen, he'll redeem you. So the Bible says at the cross the atonement was made. Romans chapter 5 and verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. What does the atonement mean? To atone for something means that you are making amends for what you've done. The atonement is, has that to do it. It means that what Christ did for you, that he made amends for all of your sins and brought you to God. And the two of you, you and God, can have peace together. So the atonement is where he paid for you. There is the cross from man's perspective. In Matthew chapter number 27 and verse number 16, and they had a notable prisoner who, called, who was called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? In plain words, the Lord Jesus Christ was to some of them a common criminal. And so therefore, he brought Barabbas out. We're talking about a secular authority. He thought for certain that this sedition, this man guilty of sedition, this murderous devil, that surely the people would not take Bar Abbas over Christ, but they did. They did. They took Bar Abbas. His name is instructive. Bar means son of. Abbas means his, he's, he's Bar, the son of, of Abba, the son of his father. And so therefore, Bar Abbas means that Barabbas is the son of his father. I wonder if his father's in John 8, 44, where it says, you are of your father, the devil. Could it be that Bar Abbas had never known anything in his life but pure hell since he'd been on this earth? But I'll tell you this right now. It was at the cross at Calvary that Christ died for Barabbas. He died for me. He died for you. The Bible said he tasted death for every man. Even Barabbas that was made free that day at the cross from man's perspective, he was a blasphemer. In John chapter 10 and verse 36, it said, Say you of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. He's a blasphemer, the high priest said, and he ripped his garments. Who is this man that dares call himself the Son of God? On the third day when he arose from the dead, I'd like for the high priest to be standing there at an empty tomb, amen, with those men in white when he came out of that place, amen, and when he ascended back to the Father 40 days later, it would have been nice if the high priest had watched him as he went up into heaven. He is the Son of God, no doubt about it, and when he comes from heaven, the Bible said the heavens will roll back like a scroll and he will sit up on that white horse and he'll come as king of kings and lord of lords. The day will come when everything of Adam's race will bow their knee to him and confess that he is Christ to the glory of God the Father. To some he's a stumbling stone. In Luke chapter 23 verse 14 it says, said unto them, ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people and behold, I have examined him before you and have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof ye accuse him. Who said that? Pontius Pilate said that. Who said that? A Roman governor said that. Who said that? A secular a warrior said that. And he said, I've examined him and I don't find any fault in him. I find, in him, I find no fault in him. My dear friend, I've examined him too. I've been examining him for a long time. And I haven't found any fault in him. He never failed me and he loves me and he puts up with me. And he deals with my, with my times of rebellion. But he's always there. Hallelujah to God. So to Pilate he was a stumbling stone. But to some he was their hope. He was their hope. The Bible says in Luke chapter number 23 and verse number 42. And he said unto Jesus. This is one of the thieves on the cross. Lord remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. 
Oh, there's two simple words. Remember me, no long. The he didn't have systematic theology. He didn't know anything about the bride of Christ. He didn't know anything about a, a, a bride, the, all of the other second coming and eschatology and all. He didn't know anything about that. He just knew that the man hanging next to him was greater than him. And he started to put his trust in him and said, Lord, remember me. Let me tell you something, folks. Salvation is not an intellectual thing. Amen. Salvation has nothing to do whether you are a Ph.D. or have an IQ of 70. Salvation is from the heart. From the heart believeth unto righteousness. There are men laying right now and women on the streets with the needles in their arm. There are those locked up in the prisons in maximum security. There are those running from the law at this moment. There are those walking the streets trying to find their next victim. Everywhere you look, everywhere man is, you're going to find these problems. And there's just one that can save you. And all you got to say to him, Lord, remember me. Remember me. Remember me. Simple, simple, folks. Simple. Remember me. So from the cross, from Satan's perspective, think about it in Genesis 3.14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. There's something going on in the Garden of Eden that's above man. There's something going on in the Garden of Eden that's stronger than our understanding. There's a hatred that Satan has for Christ that, is hun that you can't. There's no way that you can comprehend what's going on. In the book of Luke chapter number 4 and verse 9, the Bible said he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. Taking him, my dear friend, and putting him to the fifth degree. Putting him through it. And I'll tell you what happened. The Lord Jesus Christ quoted the Bible back to Satan. And have you ever noticed how that when you quote the scriptures to Satan, even though he's quoted the scriptures to you, if you quote the scriptures to Satan and you believe what you're quoting, he's gone. He's gone. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. And then there's the cross from God's perspective. In both, he's the surrendered one. In Psalm chapter number 40 and verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. The writer of Hebrews quotes that scripture. Then he said, Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. What book do you think he's quoting here? What book matters above every book? What's the most important book on the face of this earth? What's the book that makes a difference whether you're going to heaven or hell? What's the book that can make you free in this world, set you free? Every sense of the word. There's only one book. It is God's eternal word. And he said, to do thy will, O God. He's the surrendered one. Gethsemane was the last place of surrender for Christ. Not my will, but thine be done. And therefore he went to the cross. The Bible said, Almighty God, no doubt, looked down upon his son on that cross. No doubt, no doubt in my mind whatsoever. For that was the most important place on this earth. His son came to the very point that the father wanted him to come to. Into the depths of what he wanted him to go into. To feel and understand all he wanted him to feel and understand. He had to experientially go to literally the hell for us. And so the Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 53, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. God will see the travail of his soul. All we see is the body suffering. We see the nail prints. We see him when he's nailed on the cross. We see the crown of thorns on his head. We see his feet pierced. But my dear friend, the suffering of the soul was much greater than the suffering of the body. Here is the pure son of God. Pure, never sin, no sin about him. And yet on the cross at Calvary, the Bible said, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He could see it coming. And when he prayed, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter number 5, he feared and the Bible said he prayed and God heard him and delivered him from death. And when he delivered him from death, he wasn't delivering him from the cross. He was delivering him from the consequences and the power and the condemnation of death. He delivered him from it. Just like Jonah, when he was behind those bars and the seaweed running through his hair, the Bible said on the third day that whale opened its mouth and out came Jonah. Can you imagine what he looked back like when he hit the ground? 
He came out and he went to Nineveh. And he, my friend, had been three days in the whale of that belly. No doubt the digestive juices running all over him. And, and seaweed hanging off of his face. And he walked into that place looking like some kind of a zombie. And here's what Jonah had to say to Nineveh. Repent! <laughs> I'm sure they repented when they saw that. You don't want to face the living God. Amen. Amen. From God's perspective, he was a sacrifice. So what was the cross? What was the cross? When the apostle Paul said, I came preaching nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. What did he mean by that? He was preaching the cross. But what did the cross represent? What is the cross at Calvary? When God saved the apostle Paul, he made him the theologian of the cross. As I've told you a thousand times, it was Paul who laid down what the cross meant. It was Paul who laid down our relationship with God through the cross. It was Paul who laid all of that down and spelled it out to people so we could understand it. And thank God, thank God, thank God that he did so. But my friend, what was the cross? In the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle. That tabernacle was a place where God met men. The apostle says that in he, he came and he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word dwelt literally means tabernacled. When God Almighty came into a body of flesh, he tabernacled. He put on the robe of flesh. He put it on and he lived in our midst for 33 and a half years. He's always wanted to live with us. But there's no way he can live with you till he prepares you to live with him. So what was the cross? It was the tabernacle. It was the place where God dwelt among men. What was the cross? It was the brazen altar that you find outside the tabernacle. What is the brazen altar? The brazen altar is a picture of Christ, a picture of Christ on the cross. It is where the sacrifice was offered. If there's no sacrifice, there's no entering into the tabernacle. There must be first a blood covenant, a blood atonement. There must be a sacrifice there at the brazen altar. Brass in the Bible is a representation of judgment. So therefore the judgment was made outside at the brazen altar. There's something else out there and it's called the laver. What was the labor for? It was washing. In typology, the labor washed, but in typology, it was literally talking about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. Water can never wash away sin, but it's been washed away. So, once the man has offered the sacrifice, cross at Calvary. Once he has been cleansed, cross at Calvary. Then he can enter into the holy place. When he walks into the holy place, there's a candlestick, seven golden candlesticks. Across from it is a table of showbread. Next to it is, a ta is an altar of gold. It's a golden altar of incense. When you walk in there, you see the seven golden candlesticks, which is the light of God shining over on the bread. That is the work of the Holy Ghost of God. He shines to the, gives you the light of the bread. The bread, Lord, my friend, dear friend, is the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross. That's the bread of God. And the Holy Ghost is, my friend, the one that points you to that bread. If you have not been led by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit to the Lord Jesus Christ, you've met a spirit, but it's not the Holy Ghost. There's just one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. And that's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there's the table of showbread. That is to sustain your life. And this sustenance of your life is him. I live by Christ. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Christian, if you've ever truly been born again and you've turned your back on God or you've just drifted away and you've gotten cold, I'm going to tell you right now, you're miserable. You're one of the most miserable people in the world. And I'm going to tell you why. Because you know what the waters of Bethlehem are like. You know what that well, my friend, of Jacob is like. You know what the river of Jordan is like. And you know that water that bubbles up and springs from Gihon, goes into the pool of Siloam. You know what it is to take a good, cool, soothing drink of water. And you haven't had one in a long time, have you? Praise be to God, you still can. Then there's the golden altar. You're approaching God now. You're coming into his presence. That golden altar is not for sacrifice. That was made at the brazen altar outside. 
The golden altar, altar is there, gold now, golden altar, altar is there to offer up prayer, incense, a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God. I know of no greater prayer that you, I, or anyone else could offer up than the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ in the cross at Calvary. That's where you're saved, folks. You're not saved. You're not saved in, in, in his life. You're not saved at his birth. You're not saved with the people around him. You're saved by him. The the one who died Amen. it is that death that is the blood of covenant and the blood atonement that's when the new testament started at the death of the lord jesus on the cross so you go behind that altar of incense and you go through a veil you had to the priest had to go around it or crawl under it and i suppose he went around that veil to get into the holy of holies today thanks be unto god you don't go around it. You don't go under it. That veil has been ripped from the top to the bottom. And now you can go directly into the presence of Almighty God. Isn't that a good thing? Let me tell you something. If you mess around people long enough, they'll, 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 they'll take everything you got away from you spiritually. You'll get around one, well, I don't believe this. You'll get around another one, God forsook me. Or another one, I don't believe that. And this and that and this and that. You start listening to all that garbage, and it'll confuse you and suck the very life out of your soul. Get your Bible open. Start reading it. Get on your knees. Start talking to God, and you'll get your joy back. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the veil was split in top, from top to bottom. And in, his, in they went. The Bible says we have a new and living way. That is to say his flesh what he did for us. And so the cross is the door that leads us into the presence of God. The cross is the door that leads you into the presence of God. There is no other way but by the cross of Christ. So when you get in there, you've got a table of showbread, you've got seven golden candlesticks, altar of incense, you've got a, you've got a, a, a curtain, you go behind that, then you have a mercy seat. A mercy seat that's sprinkled with blood. You have a cherubim on this side, a cherubim on that side. And a high priest standing on the dirt. And there God says, I will meet with you between the cherubim. Have you ever been between the cherubim? Have you ever in your soul, in your spirit said, Lord, the Bible said God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Bible said he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, that diligently, with all your heart, if you'll come to him, he'll receive you, and you can have fellowship with the Lord. Amen. 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 There he stood. The priest was sacrificing, putting blood, blood of the bulls and goats that had been taken outside, sacrificed, blood, blood, blood. But my dear friend, the only blood that will ever count is the blood of the Son of God Amen. that was offered by himself. He's the high priest. He offered his own blood, and he offered it on the mercy seat in heaven. And because of that, we have access to the Father. The cross is the door to heaven, folks. The cross is, the, is where God meets man, and then finally the cross is the anchor of your soul. Amen. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, the anchor of your soul. Once you have really, truly been born of the Spirit of God, I don't care what religion you try, I don't care what crowd you run with, if you have the seal of God, you born of the Spirit, I want to tell you something right now. You'll never be satisfied till you come back to the cross, till you come back to Christ. And are you out here trying it today? Are you running around with a crowd? Are you out here with the intellectual crowd? Says the Bible, just an old book of wives tales. Are you out here with a crowd that says, it doesn't matter what your religion is, we're all going to the same place. Are you with that crowd? Are you with a crowd that is simply hate God? I mean, they hate God. They let you know they hate him. Have you seen these women, especially women, in the streets in the last two or three days? Have you seen them out there by the tens of thousands? So what are they doing, preacher? They're marching to kill babies. They want to kill babies. They want to kill babies. One of them had a sign and it said, sex is beautiful. Sex is beautiful. Think about it for a moment now. Sex is beautiful. They're opening up now. They're beginning to tell you what's been going on for 40 years. We want to be able to go out and do what we please. We want to live an ungodly life. 
and don't anybody telling us otherwise. And so in Roe versus Wade, 19, what, 74, somewhere in there, they opened the doors for them, and now they've been killing 60-plus million children. He'll even save them. Care who you are. He'll save you. There's a man in prison right now that killed his wife and his two little girls. Took their bodies and put them in this big oil container of some kind. You know what I'm talking about. He's locked. I think he's locked up for life. God will save him. God will save him. He died for him too. He paid what needed to be paid. If you're in this house today and you've been running wild, and you know you've been running wild so long that you can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> Believe me, I've seen that many times. He'll save you too. He'll save you too. Well, preacher, I just don't have time. You don't have to come down here. This is a man-made thing. For somebody to tell you that this is the altar and there's no other altar is religion. We have an altar that they know not of that serve the temple. Our altar is anywhere, as Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, we put our foot. Amen. It becomes holy ground. Holy Amen. ground. Preach it. Holy ground. There we can meet with God. We've got an altar. He's an anchor of the soul. Amen. Bless his name. Amen. Bless his holy righteous name and you two ladies sang this morning God bless both of you Amen. Jesse God bless you because you blessed me Father in thy name I pray bless your holy word Lord there may be somebody in the house this morning that all they know to say is Lord remember me that's all they have to say is Lord remember me remember me what a thing. What a wasted life. But it didn't end until he said, Lord, remember me. That thief on the cross went to a place that heads of Bible colleges, high and mighty in their church and denomination, will never see. In thy holy name I pray. My well, heads are bowed this morning. I definitely have a distinct feeling to do this. Does anybody in here raise your hand and say, Preacher, I want you to pray for me because, you know, God spoke to me in this message, but I don't, I'm not so sure I know the Lord. I believe in God and I believe in Jesus, but I don't know if I know him. God bless you right there. There's a hand. Anybody else raise your hand? Anybody else raise your hand? God bless you right here. There's another hand. That's what this is about, folks. This is, this is about. It's about you. God bless you. There's another hand right there. That's three hands that have gone up in this house this morning. They believe in God, I'm sure. I'm sure they do believe in God. They believe Christ. They believe in Christ. But they don't know for sure or truly if they're born of the Spirit of God because they haven't really called on Him and accepted Him into your soul. And say, how do you do that, preacher, the way you do it? Just be honest with God and cry out to Him, and He won't turn you away. That's why no formula is laid down in that Bible about being saved. It tells you what the gospel is, but it all points to Christ. Anybody else say, pray for me, preacher. Pray for me. God bless you over here. Anybody else? Father, I thank you for every hand that went up in this house. Lord, I'm nothing but the messenger. You know that. I take no credit for anything. I can't do anything. What I can do is give out your word. And I've done that now, Father. And I have peace in my soul. I'm at rest now. I'm at rest. But Heavenly Father, now it's your work. It's the work of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I pray for these people to raise their hand. God, I pray that the Holy Ghost will get, take hold of them. They'll come. They'll come. They'll come to you today. They'll come to you, not to a man. They're not coming to me, but they'll come to you. And they'll cry out to thee in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake, I ask you, bless the name of the blessed Son of the living God. Bless his holy, righteous name. Amen. Let's stand up, brother.